Okay, so uh, I will demonstrate my uh, competence in the performance of uh, this academic ritual by keeping close watch on my time and also by thanking the Mongolian Cultural Center and the Mongolian Embassy for uh, having us all here. So uh, my presentation is going to touch on a couple of things. Um, first of all, okay. well, first of all, I want to talk about nationalism, ethnography, and um, the intellectual biography of uh, Seven Jamsrano. Um, so I want to look at all of these things, uh, borrowing a concept that the historian Tang Chai when he chuckled has used called uh, the geo body. Um, you can think of this as the nation as logo. So this is a really great example of the Mongolian geobody. So this is a map produced in, I think, 1931 um, by what would become the Mongolian Academy of Sciences. So most scholarship on the geobody considers it to be like a victory of mapping and something that's very cartographically informed. Um, so I'd sort of like to expand this discussion of the geobody to include other semiotic processes, in this case, the ethnographic writings of Shamsrano. So uh, this is basically what I'm talking about. How do you go from banner to geobody in a relatively short period of time? Um, there's a lot of processes that go into this, and the one I'd like to focus on is the writing of ethnography. Um, so any of you with a keen eye will might notice that that actually is in Inner Mongolia, um, not Outer Mongolia, which will be my focus. And um, yeah, so the sources I use to investigate this um, are a 1930, 1913 copy of Jean Serrano's, um, I guess journal would probably be the best name for it, uh, Shintol. Uh, which sort of presented this extended overview of the worldwide system of nation states and locates um, Mongolia within it. Um, I happened to find this in a bottom of a closet. Go figure. You never know when you're going to find something, you know, import an important source. Um, so go digging through closets would be my advice. Um, the second source that I used was not um, found in the bottom of in the bottom of a closet. It was published. I think. Um, so it's Jean Serrano's Ethnography and Geography. So this was published sort of at the end of Jean Serrano's, uh, um, well, after Jean Serrano's career in the Mongolian People's Republic had officially ended. And he was back uh, working under Pope at that, that time in Petersburg. Um, and his sort of uh, status had been sort of of an outcast. So uh, the basic argument that I'd like to make is um, so something like this. So a lot of the fundamental scholarship on um, nation states, and I'm using that term very ambiguously, Pache, Walker, Connor, I make no sort of analytical distinction here. Let you guys do all the heavy lifting. But the foundational scholarship on nation states make it, makes it clear that um, the development of group identities relies hev heavily on the transformation of undifferentiated uh, space into national place. So rootedness in a homeland is frequently invoked by groups to signal ethnic or national belonging, and modern states are consolidated on the national territory. So by furnishing accounts of the ethnic groups inhabiting the margins of uh, the newly sort of demarcated Mongolian People's Republic, Jam Serrano sort of established the boundaries of the geobody um, in ethnographic terms. But he did so in a way that foregrounded ethnic particularism. This is something that Francine Hirsch has called double assimilation in the Soviet context. So I'd like to suggest that the way Jam Serrano details um, three revolutionary modes of belonging within the idiom of the nations. Um, tells us something about his own positionality as an intermediary between imperial and early Soviet elite Mongolian peoples, or and the Mongolian. So I'll try to address that last bit there uh, with a closer look at some of his ethnographic writings. Um, 
So at this point, you're probably wondering why this all matters, and I'd be disappointed if I didn't at least try to sell you on the importance of it. Um, we're all sort of interested in Mongolia, right? So I think first, uh, Jean Serrano's ethnographic writing can tell us very, something very important about him. Um, and I'm going to sort of argue that he's not just an agent of uh, the center, so to speak. Um, it's not this process of like a thoughtless reduplication of um, this ethnographic knowledge or ethnographic methodologies and ideas that were acquired in St. Petersburg in the context of the Russian Far East and Outer Mongolia. So um, he's, he's working with a borrowed intellectual framework, but it's not deployed passively. I also think we can learn something important about the Mongolian People's Republic. So as I've alluded to a little bit earlier, um, you know, this kind of ethnographic writing and um, what we might call ethnic particularism played an important role in the ideological construction of the nation state. Again, I'm Ache Walker Connor. Um, so third, we can also learn something about nationalism. So Mongolia is a bit of an odd duck when it comes, it never really fits any, um, it really fits into any great studies of nationalism. You know? So there's no sort of proletariat. Um, there's not a lot of urbanization. And it's always sort of a challenge to mesh the historical reality of Mongolia with the theoretical literature on nationalism. And I think we can see this played out in John Serrano's ethnographic writing. So um, I don't want to spend a lot of I am going over like a, an extended intellectual biography of Jean Serrano here, but um, he was a student of Sergei F. Oldenburg, uh, St. Petersburg. He was one of Russia's leading scholars on Buddhism. And he was, Oldenburg was head of uh, the Imperial Russian Geographical Society's um, ethnographic division. And you can think of these as the people that would like go out into the Caucasus, measure skulls and um, write descriptions of people's noses, for example, and uh, do household service. So um, he was really sort of trained by the most elite ethnographers and geographers in um, late imperial Russia. So his collaboration with Oldenburg would have a very significant impact on his own work as an ethnographer. Um, and we can see this when he really places a lot of emphasis on um, uh, social structure in his really early works among the Buryats. So he talks a lot about tribal solidarity as one of um, the things that's really important to um, emphasize in the context of Buryatian, directly from Oldenburg. Um, but we also see some other, um, some other influences here. And here we have Tom Serrano expressing the sort of three part. Um, characterization of humanity that comes directly from Speransky's writings in 1822. Um, and John Serrano, uh, I don't want to put words into his mouth, but I can't really help it um, here. Um, he was a pretty big fan of Speransky. Um, so he, in Shintol, in New Mir, literally suggesting he wants to provide Mongols with a new way to see themselves and sort of changing economic and political conditions. Find this division of humanity in wandering, nomadic, and um, settled modes of subsistence. So these aren't these kind of like sociological cul-de-sacs that we see in other more teleological um, models of like humanity. Um, and a lot of his ethnographic writing really blurs the dis really blurs any kind of clear distinction category. We also see some other um, Influences, influences of the time appear in his writing. So in Shintol in 1913, um, we have this kind of Herderian cultural nationalism uh, where we see him write, and apologies for the clunky translation. Um, a nation is formed when peoples of the world share a language, ancestry, religion, set of customs, and inhabit the same land. So uh, this was published in the same year that Stalin published um, Marxism and the National Question, right? So these look very sort of similar on the face of 
Um, but what's really notable in John Serrano's writing is there's no um, Hilnerian sort of political roof that needs to cover the nation. So it's not predicated on a kind of like political formation, right? Um, or any sort of level of political development. Uh, it's really sort of a kind of cultural. So one of the things that this definition might lead you to suspect is that Jean Serrano's kind of foregrounding like sameness. Um, but things get a little bit more complicated when we look at what he actually wrote. So in Jean Serrano's ethnography, he details um, 16 different um, ethnic groups in the sort of newly demarcated geographical boundaries of the Mongolian People's Republic. And he does so according to the outline, sort of according to the criteria of nationhood that he establishes, in, that he had established in Shintul almost 20 years earlier. So he talks a lot about language, ancestry, religion, customs, and of course, territory. Um, but what we see him doing, he's not trying to sort of um, deny all sorts of diverse origins or uh, varied sort of linguistic and economic practices in uh, the groups he uh, visits, ethnographic descriptions. Um, what we do learn is that um, all of these groups are more different than they are the same, basically. So this is sort of evidence of this, what I'm calling this foregrounding of ethnic particularism. Um, he's not trying to fit all of his observations into some kind of cookie cutter mold of uh, what is a nation. Um, so we learn a lot of interesting, the Hotung um, uh, only recently became like really fears of Mongolia. Um, the Dorwood, um, He sort of analyzes the ancestry of the Dorvid and the Arhad. Um, and so most of, most of his work is on Western Mongolia. So uh, he writes about all of these customs and the exact spaces that people inhabit. So um, even before he gets into a real sort of analysis of anything, what, he's, what we basically see is this um, way to Jam is tying people to land, right? So I think it's really significant that he uses, you know, 16 different ethnic groups and leaves out a whole bunch of other ones. So we're not reading about the trans Baikal Buryats or anyone in Mongolia, right? So it's this kind of meta communication about who is within the Mongolian people. So one of the most interesting parts, to me at least, of um, his ethnography is his, his account of the Dorvid. So um, we learn that they're primarily um, nomadic pastoralists, and uh, like all nomadic pastoralists, they move between different camps in the course of a year. So John Serrano goes on to explain that they also practice what he calls primitive agriculture. And he doesn't really tell us what primitive agriculture is, probably something to do with irrigation, but we don't really know. But what we do learn is it was actually practiced on a pretty large scale, which isn't particularly notable um, for Western Mongolia, right? Um, but we do learn that the Dorvid have a really high percentage of people engaged in agriculture. Like 25% of the Dorvid are practicing agriculture alongside nomadic pastoralism. So we see Jean Serrano um, basically blurring this distinction between the nomadic and settled mode uh, of subsistence. And one of the things that's really interesting, um, you know, Jean Serrano doesn't rely on these sort of common explanations of like um, agricultural behavior that are sort of contemporaneous. So um, we don't see him talking about like, people turning to agriculture because of a lack of land or a want of capital, right? It's these two sort of modes of economics and subsistence. I want to... um, we also don't really see any mention of class here. 
Um, so for Jean Serrano, it really makes no sense to see this class outside of a monetized economy, which also sort of sets him apart from other ethnographers at the time. Um, so nearly 40 years later, uh, Feinstein would pretty much write the same kind of description of the Tuvan economy. So far from being antithetical to the nomadic pastoral economy, agriculture is a central part of inter-Asian nomadic pastoralism, right? Um, and the same conclusion holds for craft manufacturing. So outside of this urban, capital-heavy economy, craft production and agriculture are really unable to permanently separate themselves. Um, and this sort of blurs the distinction that Jean Serrano makes between three modes of economic. So um, by way of conclusion, I'd just like to suggest that Looking at Jean Serrano's ethnographic writings, we can learn some interesting things about the early Mongolian People's Republic and about Jean Serrano's own positionality as a scholar. Um, so, you know, like I said, the foundation, the foundational literature on um, nations and states makes it clear that um, the development of group identity relies heavily on this kind of transformation of undifferentiated space into national place. And by furnishing these ethnographic accounts, um, Dom Serrano is sort of establishing ethnographic boundaries of this geo body that had been delimited in political terms as well. So um, it's an example of how ethnic particularism is um, really sort of a central part in the ideological construction of the nations. And this is um, um, sort of consistent with scholarship on um, ethnography and ethnographic writings well. Um, but one of the things that I find really interesting about Jean Serrano's work is he's not, it's not really predicated on the fact that there's this like really sharp epistemic break between like pre-national and national modes of belonging. Um, there's no sort of like switch that goes off and makes people national overnight, right? He uses all of these, um, all of these ethnographic descriptions, um, but he sort of deploys them within the idiom of the nations. Um, and this sort of ties into a second point I'd like to make about Jean Serrano more specifically, is he really complicates this like, um, this is sort of a straw man, but if there were an argument that John Serrano is just sort of agent of the center or a sort of um, agent of late imperial and early Soviet um, elites, he really complicates that picture because the sort of frameworks that he's using aren't deployed passive. They're borrowed frameworks, but they're adapted um, his own ethnographic work. And um, uh, he, so, his relationships among the elites of the early Mongolian People's Republic were usually pretty strained. So I think this sort of speaks to um, John Serrano being caught between sort of the cosmopolitan center of St. Petersburg and academic life in um, you know, late imperial and early Soviet Russia and being sort of an outcast in the early Mongolian Republic. So that's... Thank you very much. So, so we, uh, we have 10 minutes, so that means you can have uh, questions and also up uh, here, introduction. Uh -oh. introduction. Okay. Um, I have two questions. One is, uh, you kind of suggest, I, I suddenly, when you said it, I said, oh, yeah, that's what Shinto, he calls it a new mirror. Um, are you, you kind of were suggesting that he, he was kind of deliberately saying, this is the mirror in which you Mongols can look at yourself. That's, yeah, that's exactly. I don't want to cut you off. Question, yeah. and you can answer both. The other one is, is um, uh, I wonder if you could place uh, Jean Serrano's project, as far as I know, in 1934, was part of a larger project, which also involved his writing of this history of Mongolia. And the study of that project, it's been great. We now have the, um, the former president, Dilbert George, produced this, uh, uh, this uh, uh, 
uh, great this great set of volumes of nine volumes of the histories of Mongolia. So even the ones that were never actually produced, where are we now for the Qing period, for example, we now have them. Uh, and also Simakov's Atlas, which was produced right around the same time. Mm -hmm. So it looks like 1934, of course, is all within the, um, uh, uh, the new term policy, So could you place this within, to what extent do we know about what Jean Serrano placed it within that context? Was he given a charge? Uh, did he have to put it within some kind of context? And how do we, how does that change how we read Jean Serrano when we realize all the, these guys were also making a national atlas and a national history? Okay, so I'll try my best. So the, fir the very first slide on the PowerPoint, right, is this 1931, One, I think at this time it's the Sudor of the Chin Freiling, not the Academy of Sciences. So this is very much a product of the new turn policy. So if you take a close look at this map, um, you know it's all of these things. There, it's not like location of the Shevnar or something like this. These are all sort of these very new property forms that have come about in the 1930s, right? These, I forget exactly what's on it, but um, so this whole mapping project is a product of the of the new turn. Um, as far as Jean Serrano's specific relationship with like Dindub or other people that were writing these histories, um, I haven't ever actually come across anything specific, especially about like the sort of mandate for the production of the ethnography. All I know that it is that it was compiled over a series of like three or four years around like 1930, but um, since John Serrano is the person responsible for founding what would later become the Academy of Sciences, there it would seem plausible to assume that they are all part of this massive kind of push. So it's, um, they're all sort of ideological uh, constructions about well, Mongolia a history of, three-part history of Mongolia, and Simakov's Atlas of, does the same thing that Jean Serrano is basically doing with written words in Shin Tol. So Shin Tol is one of the very first productions of this movable type press that Jean Serrano introduced to then Urga in 1911. So he, I mean, it's literally uh, designed to induce this like reflexive awareness among people who don't know, like, um, know why he like describes like thunder and lightning the basic principles of electricity and precipitation humidity and all of these geographical features about the world um the sort of system of states and kingship and he locates Mongolia he basically gives a an extended overview of every single country like known to man um to basically show you know because we have descriptions, also like Pope's reminiscences, right? We have these descriptions, like, uh, you know, Mongolians, Mongolians are incredibly naive. You can leave your box of money with them and no one will steal anything. We have, like, you know, descriptions in literature, like um, the horizons of knowledge for the average sort of herder are just like an, you know, like an overturned bowl or something like that. So I think it really is like a kind of new mirror. say that it all revolves around access accesses to resources in banner. Um, I'd say that is like the uh, primary sort of the primary, primary sort of that's the fundament of political subjectivity in uh, pre-revolutionary Mongolia is uh, 
for all that, you know, of uh, a banner, and in turn you have access to resources in the past year. Um, you know, there are lots of other things, pilgrimages, uh, either to the Gypsum Dhamma Hutu or to Beijing or something like that, maybe also. I just want to add here the the regarding the questions of Professor Atwood's questions. So the toil bichik, shin toil bichik, toil has a uh, kind of two different, not really different, two uh, meanings that uh, it's not only today we know the toil in the Mongolian language, we understand that the mirror that we can see ourselves, but in a uh, in the Mongolian mythology, in the tale, toil means not just yourself. It's just a, where you want to see, and then you see, and then this toil will show you. Usually in the Mongolian uh, folk uh, stories that uh, the story shows the way in the uh, other part of the world, what's how, I mean, that's why we uh, the name the dictionary is Tölbichig. It's uh, not really seeing yourself. Uh, it's uh, what is this word? And that, that's Tölbichig will show you. Not only the you. The, so, <laughs> Uh, in the middle of your PVD, I, I saw a word of cotton when you were introducing a Jones Narrow's ethnography. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't understand that word. Uh, so it's the name of one of the uh, ethnic jumps from. Uh, so, according to Jean Serrano, not exactly all of them were. Uh, so, if you want to define them in terms of, of like religion, is always a great thing to look at, right? For sort of like identity, especially in Central Asia. So, uh, you know, captives from Bukhara or wherever they were taken from. Yeah, and also in this case, uh, he's uh, referring mm -hmm. to. And then you can ask your question the camera here. We have a representative there. So, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Cotton birds there, yeah. around the United States that I interact with, there's, there's an indelible connection between Mongol and boards. And I don't know where that came from and, and how long it's been forming. Well, I, I'll influence. save the philological speculation for the next panel because I'm sort of bad. I always get everything wrong, but board, you know, ultimately derives from the Mongolian word for like a palace tent, right? Like a palace tent? Oh, oh, like, yeah, like a tent. Like, you're not like a full size computer, right? Well, the English is certainly uh, Also, the, about the wood, the wood exactly the Mongo, the, the Mongo or Mengo, this word is appeared in the, uh, in the historical uh, text with the Professor Edwin. Um, nailed, nailed it. That, uh, was a term for second Mongolian word, one of the few Mongolian words in English, oh. and it, uh, horde ref the it comes from the well, it's Turco Mongolian, whether it's originally Turkic or Bardic Mongolian, originally Mongolian Bardic or Turkish is uh, a debate for uh, other, other times, but uh, it me refers to these sort of large. Uh, huge tents, which are also centers of organization, and each one of them also would have, a, for each prince or khan would have their own uh, orda or palace tent, and that would have a large bodyguard associated with it. So it did have actually sort of peoples associated with it. So um, uh, I guess that's what it, where where the Oxford English Dictionary would find Mongol hordes for the first time in English. I don't know. That would be interesting. <laughs> interesting. Maybe um, Philip could study that. Thank you. Thank you very much.
Very interesting paper, sir.